for our webinar, part of a webinar series hosted by the Collaborative on Faith and Disability. This is entitled, How Can Churches Become Places of Belonging? And our guest speaker today is Amy Julia Becker. I am Molly Cole. All right, Erica, it's not moving. All right, yes. got it, thank you. So we, this is hosted by the Collaborative on Faith and Disabilities. This is the vision and mission of the Collaborative. You can certainly go to their website to learn more about the Collaborative if you're not familiar. Uh, we are fortunate to have with us on the call today, Bill Gaventa, who is just a wealth of knowledge and um, has been overseeing this Collaborative with a number of other individuals for a while now. So great resource. That is the vision and mission. Please take a look at both of those. I'm going to keep going because I want to give Amy Julia uh, as much time as possible. As you can see, there are a number of collaborative partners. I am with the University of Connecticut, you said. There are a number of other USEDs or University Centers for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities across the country who are part of this endeavor. And uh, there have been a series of webinars hosted by the collaborative over the years. So we should be thinking about what we'll see in the fall um, towards the end of the summer as we wait out the quarantine and see where things are going. A couple of important notes. We are recording this and we will post it soon on the Collaborative on Faith and Disability website. And the uh, website address is there, faithanddisability.org. So as soon as we have the link, we will send it and you should feel free to uh, share that. All slides, mentioned resources and several helpful links are gonna be posted along with the webinar recording. So you will have some other resources. Amy Julia Becker will also be sharing with you some resources that she will discuss in her presentation. Um, questions should be submitted to the chat box for discussion. We only have an hour. Um, so please type your questions into the chat box. Bill is going to monitor the chat box, so we'll try and, and answer some of them along the way and perhaps answer some of them in discussion at the end of the presentation. All your phone lines should be muted at this point. Um, and information on coming webinars sh will be shared also, probably not at the end of the webinar, but at a later date. With that, I want to introduce, Join the meeting. introduce your guest speaker for the day, Amy Julia Becker. Amy Julia Becker is a writer. She's a speaker on faith, family, disability, and privilege. Amy Julia has written four books. Uh, her writing has been published in USA Today, Christianity Today, The Washington Post, The New York Times. She's spoken at a number of conferences, including the Festival of Faith and Writing, the Q Ideas Conference, and the Summer Institute for Theology and Disability. And those presentations at the Summer Institute are available on their website. Um, Amy spoke twice, once in 2012 and once in 2019, and I believe Bill is going to post the link to that in the chat box. Uh, she's also spoken at many churches and schools. We are blessed in that Amy Julia lives in Connecticut uh, with her husband and her three children, including their daughter Penny, who has Down syndrome. Her writings come from many of her personal experiences and her own family. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Amy Julia. Great, thanks Molly. And thanks to all of you who were able to tune in today. It's funny because Bill and I started talking about this webinar in the winter uh, when we had no idea how um, frequent webinars would become in our lives. But I'm glad everyone has become more attuned to Zoom technology, myself included. Um, and I actually think that this topic for a little while, I thought, oh my gosh, that now is not the time to be talking about churches as places of belonging when we are in many cases distanced physically from church. And uh, Bill and I actually originally this webinar was scheduled for April and we did bump it a month for exactly that reason because it just didn't seem like the right time. But I believe that now as we actually across the nation are in conversations about what does it mean 
not just to reopen churches, because of course they've been open throughout this time, but to reopen sanctuaries and the physical spaces in which we gather, it gives us an opportunity to pause and to ask, who are we and who belongs among us in our individual institutions and even more collectively as churches? I believe that right now is a time for reimagining the church for asking questions about our past, our present, and our future. And it is in asking those questions in thinking, praying, relating, and then acting in sometimes very small and subtle and other times very um, large and transformative ways that we can move from becoming places, whether they are places of exclusion, places of tolerance, places of inclusion, to places of belonging. And I'm going to explain in a few minutes what I mean by those terms and what I mean by how we might be able to walk uh, from one place to another collectively. I will give one example, though, of the type of thing I'm talking about, even in this moment. Our church, I am a member of an evangelical covenant church uh, here in our small town of Washington, Connecticut. And our church is, ha, involves a lot of elderly members, which is to say members who are both particularly vulnerable at this time of pandemic, but also a number of members who do not have uh, computer technology. And so they have been more physically cut off from the church than say my family has, because we've been able to participate in live Facebook services. We've been able to participate in Zoom meetings and fellowship hours and Bible studies. We've been able to receive prayer requests through email. And so we have a church, as a church have decided that the way we are going to reopen our Sunday services is to design for the vulnerable. What would it mean for our most vulnerable members to be safe and welcome in our sanctuary? And how can we return physically to that space in such a way uh, that we make room for those who do not have access to church services and the like online? We haven't answered all the questions yet. Um, and we're grateful for summertime when we may be able to meet um, outdoors more frequently. But I think even asking that question, uh, which may have implications for a family like mine, we who typically are um, at the center of a church because of our age and our abilities and leadership and the fact that we span both the youth ministry and the children's ministry and the adult Bible study, um, we might not be physically going back to church for a while in order to make room for the single people who are feeling incredibly lonely right now, or to make room for, in safe ways, the people who are not on computers and over the age of 75 who need to come back and be and gather together. I take that and I share that as an example of what it means to be reimagining churches and to do so in a way that asks who belongs here and how can we communicate a sense of welcome and belonging, especially to those who are the most vulnerable and who are often the least likely to be considered and to be central to who we are. So that's the question for today. How can churches become places of belonging? Um, and you'll see on this slide just a picture um, that is me with my daughter Penny about 12 or 13 years ago when actually she was one, she's 14 now. I gave birth to Penny when I was 28 years old, and I was a seminary student at the time. My demographic profile is that of an educated, married, white, Christian, affluent woman. I was not expecting to have a child with Down syndrome. And when she was diagnosed, it uh, prompted lots and lots of questions um, and doubts and fears, as well as, of course, the overwhelming love that parents experience for their children. There's a lot to that story, um, and I'm not going to share most of it now. I have written a book about it, so if you're interested, uh, it's called A Good and Perfect Gift, um, and it came out in 2012, so a long time ago. But I share that because in having a child with an intellectual disability, what happened to us as a family and personally is that we both had a foot inside the world of 
unearned social advantages, all of those uh, things I listed before about being white and affluent and educated and married gave me and my husband unearned social advantages, not just in the world, but also in our church. And now that we had a child with a disability, we had a child who was both in and outside of that world. We had a child who entered into a history, again, in the culture at large, as well as in the church, a history of exclusion, um, a history of discrimination, a history of ignorance as well, um, often very benign and well-meaning ignorance. This photo was actually taken on a day when Penny was one and a half and we were invited over to our a youth pastor's house. Our youth pastor and his wife also had a child around the same age. And I remember that day and it looks from the photo like it was a really wonderful day, but I remember it because it was a really hard day for me as a mom because Penny was not able to do the same things that the other children were able to do. And so the other children were not sitting on their mom's laps. They were playing together just a few feet away and Penny was not there with them. And it was one of those first moments for me of going out and starting to wonder, am I always gonna be comparing my child to other children? Will she feel excluded? Am I being, is she being excluded right now? Um, what is going on here? So it was a day where we did not experience a feeling of belonging, even though we had been graciously welcomed and even though no one had done anything wrong. Um, Molly, you can move to the next slide. What I over time have learned about is a progression that I believe uh, can happen, has happened in our culture and in many of our churches, a movement from exclusion to tolerance to inclusion. And often we get stuck there. So let me explain what I mean. Exclusion, you know, you go back a hundred years, people were born with Down syndrome and put into institutions. Uh, so that was true, whether you were talking again about schools, about churches, um, or about the family even. Uh, people with intellectual disabilities were excluded. We also saw that in other areas of our social life, whether we're talking about, um, I think, race and gender being the other areas where you can certainly historically see areas of exclusion. But we moved as a culture to a place of tolerance. And in the place of tolerance, it's like, it's okay for you to be here, just okay, but it's okay for you to be here on our terms play by our rules, make sure you don't rock any boats or make any waves, and fine, we'll have you here. Inclusion is the next step past tolerance. And again, I think many spaces, and I'm grateful for this in our culture, are places that at least want to be places of inclusion. And what I would call inclusion is you are welcome here. We'd really like to have you here but we're still welcoming you on our terms. We're still asking you, if you are someone who for whatever reason is on the margins, we're asking you to conform to the way we do church or to the way we do school or to the way we do family or whatever it is. Belonging is a different experience. Belonging is an experience in which the terms of welcome, the terms of inclusion have changed in order to recognize the fact that we need each other. So it's not just saying, hey, you on the margins, we will include you at the center because we know how much you need us to do that. It's saying, hey, people, we need each other. And often the work stops at inclusion and doesn't move to belonging. And that's what I'm hoping we can discuss here today is how to make that move. There's another resource I, resource I want to mention, and I'm going to send an email. We're going to send an email within the next 24 hours for everyone registered um, so that you'll get a link to this resource as well as the other resources that are mentioned in this webinar today. Um, it was put together by a guy named Dan Vanderplatz, and it's called The Five Stages of Incorporation. And he too is talking about how churches and congregations as well as individuals can move along a spectrum. It's a different spectrum than this one, but I think they work together really nicely um, and it's a helpful resource. So I will offer that to you. 
Um, we can go to the next slide where I want to show you all just a picture of our family now. It's actually, it's about a year ago. Um, you'll see Penny in red. She is 14 now. Um, and we have two younger children, William, who's now 11, and Marilee, who is nine. That's my husband, Peter, and me. Um, and I will say that now we have experienced church as a place of belonging. There are other places where Penny, I'm sure, has been excluded. She is in middle school, after all. Um, and other places where she's been tolerated or included. But I would say that for her, the church has been a place of belonging. What do I mean by that? That she belongs there. Again, on a kind of big picture level, I mean there's a sense that she is not just needy, but needed. She is not just vulnerable, but gifted. She is seen as a full human being and incorporated into the body of believers in such a way that she is not simply being served, but is also asked to serve. So Penny reads scripture. Penny is asked to write a prayer when other people are writing prayers for our church. Penny is um, asked to participate in any aspect of church life and she is missed if she's not there. A very tangible and um, small example of this in the past week, we are um, going to be getting the kids who are involved in confirmation together for an appropriately socially distanced final picnic this year. And our pastor called me and said, um, I was thinking of giving each kid a water gun because I figured they could do that safely and still play with each other without touching. But I don't think Penny would really like a water gun. Um, what, what should we do about this? And what was so great about that moment was A, that our pastor knows Penny well enough to know that she does not like sudden movement or things being thrown at her unexpectedly, even when it involves water. But B, that instead of saying, um, oh well, poor Penny, she'll have to sit on the sidelines, she said, hey, let's troubleshoot this together. I talked to Penny about it and she said, mom, all I need to do is take off my glasses. I'll have fun with the water gun. So it ended up not being an issue, but um, I just appreciated that sense of we're not going to move forward, even though this is the only plan I've been able to come up with, unless we do that together. And unless we do that in a way that honors all of our students and all of our kids. I do think there've been some factors that have helped Penny to be in a place of belonging having a mom who is a leader in the church, um, I'm a lay person, but I'm on our church council, is certainly helpful because it makes her visible. Um, the fact that she is uh, a very verbal communicator, I think has also just been helpful to her. And we're in a small church where kind of everybody needs everybody else. And I think there are um, opportunities that come in larger churches as well as limitations. Um, that can arise in those church settings as well. And perhaps we'll have a chance to talk about those um, later. So I don't think it's been um, that our experience is just exactly how everyone else's should go. But I just wanna mention that we have had an experience of belonging within our church. And I do think that has not only been a blessing to our family, but been a blessing to the church as well. So next slide, here's our question for today. How can churches become places of belonging? And I'm gonna talk about some of the realities and statistics that tell us about who churches are and where we could go. And I hope I'll equip you with a few practical tools. But the most simple answer to how churches can become places of belonging is that they want to. The most simple answer in terms of churches becoming places of belonging is that they want to become reconciling communities. And that might be reconciliation when it comes to disability and people with disabilities being excluded in the past. It also can relate to all sorts of other social divisions and realities. I'm gonna go through some slides here um, just to demonstrate, and it, this is like a skimming the surface. Uh, we could do a whole webinar on each of these slides in terms of the um, sociological data about our churches reflecting not places of belonging, but reflecting the reality of being places of division. But just to kind of skim through this, uh, the first slide I have, which is the next slide here, churches are places of social division. And if you click through one more, 
90% of African American Christians worship in all black churches, 90% of white American Christians worship in all white churches. So again, that is um, a reality, a social reality that many of us live in because of historical uh, forces that have grown up around us. It also reflects the fact that culturally, white and black Christians, white and black people tend to live in uh, socially divided communities, go to schools that are relatively segregated. And so this is again, just an indication of the fact that churches in reality are places of social division. Um, the next slide demonstrates this as well in terms of just socioeconomic divisions. In the 1970s, the difference in church attendance among four income groups was relatively small. By 2018, a quarter of the wealthiest Americans reported never attending services. 35% in the bottom bracket of income never darkened a church door, which is to say over, you know, about 60% of the population um, in that top and bottom quartile is not coming to church at all. And so again, you've got a socioeconomic division instead of a place where, as the New Testament paints for us, you've got rich and poor who are becoming worshipers of God together and who are learning and growing, but also helping one another together. So again, churches are places of social division. Uh, the next slide, two more slides, just real quick to talk about um, this reality when it comes with, to people with disabilities. People with disabilities are less likely to attend worship services. There are all sorts of reasons for that um, and less likely to attend Bible studies and other church activities. And that might be one of the questions that's worth asking in your own community in response to this webinar today. Uh, and then finally, the next slide, more than half of parents of kids with special needs reported that their child with a disability had been excluded at church. So this is the reality that a lot of parents, church communities are living with. Um, and we're really focused on disability here in this webinar, but the question of belonging is not only focused on disability and the significance of belonging is not only one that is significant for communities with people with disabilities among them. It's also not a new problem. We talk a lot in America in 2020 about social divisions and we have a lot of sociological data that tells us about these divides. But if we look back to the early church over and over and over again, we see the divisions that were erupting. And in that case, it was particularly between Jews and Gentiles. The entire book of Ephesians is written to address this problem of division between Jews and Gentiles and to say central to the mystery of the gospel is that in Christ, these two groups have been reconciled. So when we talk about reconciliation, when we talk about belonging, when we talk about coming together in these ways, we're talking about the heart of the gospel. And we're talking about something that is different than the way our culture operates. And so it can feel hard to overcome these divisions because they reflect entrenched human realities that we tend to bunch up together with people who seem to be like us. And yet it's also a problem that is central to God's heart. And if we think about the banquet table that Jesus describes as the wedding feast that we will all participate in when we come face to face, who's there? Well, the rich are invited, but so are the poor. The able-bodied are invited, but so are the lame and the blind. Everyone is invited to that table and our churches are meant to be communities that represent, that are signposts pointing to the kingdom of God. The image of the body of Christ, which also runs throughout the New Testament is one of not just every part belonging, but every part benefiting another part, every human being gifted and equipped, but also being needy and dependent upon one another. One of the things that I've come to understand as the mother of a child with a disability is that belonging is something that is good for her, without a doubt. But her belonging my incorporation and connection, not just to Penny, but to other people with disabilities and other people who are not like me in terms of their demographic profile, but who are like me in terms of their common humanity, 
and their love of Jesus, that sense of belonging is not just for Penny. It is also for me. You can go to the next slide now, um, which is just a simple statement. Social divisions harm everyone. When Penny was first born, I felt like my job as an advocate and a warrior who was out to protect my daughter was simply to prevent exclusion, to bring her into the circle where I already had landed by virtue of my birth and the unearned social advantages I had been given. Over time, I began to recognize that it was not, this experience of exclusion was not just harming her, but that for me, in a homogenous space, in a space with other people who were as achievement oriented and perfectionistic and as individualistic as I was, even within the church context, to bring myself into relationship, into friendship, into care and community with people who did not hold those values in such high esteem, with people who cared about community and about love, even if that meant slowness, even if that meant simplicity, even if that meant uh, things not being as efficient, that was a tremendous healing gift for me. And again, I've written lots about that experience and I'm not gonna go into it all now, except to say that for you all to be asking the question, what does it mean for our church to become a place of belonging? This is not just a question that is for those who are currently on the outside. It is also a question for those who are currently on the inside. I think the previous slide we skipped over real quick. I have no idea why that. That's all right. It just <laughs> says. <laughs> I have no idea why that's good. But what no problem. But it that. says that churches can be places of belonging and healing. And that is the hope and the desire here today. Um, I'm going to real quick just read and talk about this story from the Gospels. Uh, that There's so much here we will not have time to get into but I think it paints a picture of Jesus's heart for healing. We think about healing, we tend to think about physical ailments being cured. That's not really what Jesus was about. He was about healing individuals, but he was about healing them in the context of their communities, which meant that he was also about healing the community. And that's what I really wanna focus on today is the way in which Jesus wants to heal our broken communities by enabling us to come together. Yep, oh, here we go. Churches yes. can be <laughs> become places it. of healing and belonging. Uh, but now we're going to move on to um, Mark chapter 5, verses 25 through 34. And I'm just going to um, teach a little bit from this passage in a minute. Let me read it first. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhaging stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. You can go to the next slide. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Jesus offers us a way of integrated healing, and it's a way that's available for all individuals within their communities, and that's what we see in this passage. Um, if we go to the next slide, I wanna talk about this passage and talk about the nature of healing that we see as a result of this. The first thing is that, and there are four points we'll get to here. The first is that healing is holistic. So you can, Molly, just tag, tag that on, I think. Yep, holistic, which is to say it's for the mind, the body, and the spirit. I'm not going to spend much time on this point, um, but the word for healing that comes up in that passage is the same word as salvation. 
So if we hear this as only being about her physical wholeness and cure, we are missing the depth and the breadth of what Jesus is doing in bringing not just physical cure, um, but actually a broader understanding of healing into her life. But then secondly, the second point is that healing is social. And the social healing that we see here happens in that this is all happening in a crowd. And so what Jesus is doing is saying this destitute woman who has not only been suffering pain and losing all of her money, but has also been cut off from community, cut off from her religious community, especially because not just is she ill, but she is bleeding and considered unclean, cut off presumably from family and from any economic employment, cut off from her society. So for her to be publicly declared healed is Jesus's way of saying, take her back. Take her back and that is a part of her healing, but it's also a part of your healing as a community. The next thing we th see about the nature of healing is that it's participatory. I'm so astonished every time I read this passage and there are others in the New Testament where Jesus says this as well, to hear him say, your faith has healed you. We know that power has gone out from him. And yet he says to her, your faith has healed you. I heard Gary Haugen, who's the um, head of International Justice Mission today, say that God gives us the dignity of responsibility. And God gave this woman the dignity of responsibility of participating in her healing. And that is also true for all of us that we are the ones who participate in the work that God is doing to mend our communities and to bring us together. And then the final thing we see in this story, and again, there's so much more to say, um, but we see that healing is for all. I didn't include the brackets to this story in which Jairus, who is the local synagogue leader, has come to Jesus. So Jairus is a man and he's got a name and he's got a house, which means he has money. And Mark includes the detail three times that Jairus is the synagogue leader, which is to say he is the head of the religious community that would have declared this woman unclean. And so by the time we get to this healing, which is happening in front of Jairus, we might expect Jesus to rebuke Jairus. The reason the disciples wanted Jesus to push on through and not stop and ask who had touched him in the crowd is because he was supposed to be going towards Jairus's house and do that important thing for the important guy. But instead Jesus pauses and in front of Jairus, he heals this woman and he pronounces her well and he calls her his daughter. He gives her the ultimate term of belonging in front of Jairus. And again, we might expect him to rebuke Jairus, but instead he goes on to heal Jairus's daughter as well. And what we see here is that Jesus's healing and his care and his touch and his power is not simply for the people who know themselves on the margin. It is not only for the powerless and the nameless, although it is certainly for them, but it is also for the powerful. It is also for the privileged. It is also for the people at the center, the people like Jairus, because we all are in need of the healing that Jesus offers to us personally, but also to us as a community, as we are knit together to become places and people of belonging. The next slide also is um, based on this passage, which gives us what I believe is a model for healing. And I'm just going to really quickly mention these three things. We acknowledge harm, just as this woman knew that she needed uh, Jesus's help. She acknowledged harm first, and then we ask for help, and then we participate in healing. So in the next maybe 10 minutes, I want to give time for a question. I'm just going to try to talk through these three aspects of acknowledging harm, reaching out for help, and participating in healing. I've written a book, a very short book, it's a free ebook that I've also recorded as an audio book, and I'm gonna send that to you all as a follow-up email um, later today or early tomorrow once we have all the links to all the resources that you can receive from this webinar. And that will spell out all of these um, in even greater detail with some questions as well as with some stories and links to further reading and resources. 
But the idea is that whether you're an individual or an institution, if you're concerned about the harm of social division and you want to be a part of places that are places of belonging, and if you want to be a part of bringing that type of healing, then here's a way that you can think and live and act through that. This should be relevant for any aspect of social division, not just in talking about people with disabilities, although again, it certainly is relevant there. Um, and finally, this is a holistic process. That's why I talk about the head, the heart, and the hands. Um, it's a helpful way to remember what we're talking about, but it's also a way to demonstrate the fact that, again, these actions come out of relationships and out of a mindset, out of information. They come out of our whole being and they will be lifelong works. To become a place of belonging is not something that happens by um, taking a checklist and doing the top three things on the list. Becoming a place of belonging is a commitment that's institutional in nature, but it comes from the head, the heart, and the hands. So to start here with this idea of using your head, um, this might mean gathering a group of people. I think if you're working with an institution, then who are the other people who say, you know what? I think there's more that we could do as a church to become a place of belonging. And to begin, whether that's a church council or elder board, or even just within a small group or a community group or a separate task force or committee of people who want to address these questions and to ask the question, how do we use our heads to acknowledge harm and to, find, to, to learn? What do we need to learn? And this is gonna be different from community to community and congregation to congregation but finding out what is the history of this place when it comes to disability, when it comes to race, when it comes to socioeconomic status, what has happened in the past? What is our current reality? What's the demographic profile of our congregation and of our local community from which we're drawing a congregation? How do we fit in to that picture? And then you can start asking the questions and are, how do our church buildings and programs reflect who we want to be. I was walking into church a couple of years ago and I happened to see an elderly woman named Edie struggling to get in the door. And Edie walked with a cane and a ramp would have been a really helpful way for her to walk into our church. We only have one step. And so for people like me, hadn't even thought of it before. But of course, I'm in a church. I can't just decide to build a ramp. And so I go to the council and I tell them this problem and everyone's concerned. And so we build the ramp and I see that Edie is still struggling up the steps with her cane. And I said, Edie, we built a ramp. And she said, well, yeah, but there's no railing. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And so we went back, we made the railing and now Edie can get into church with the railing, which actually ended up prompting us to say, gosh, I mean, we're such a small church. We don't have requirements that make this uh, something we have to do. We don't have seating in our sanctuary for someone who uses a wheelchair. Why not? And thankfully at this point, because of the way we have been thinking as a church, we wanted to make sure that we provided that seating in such a way that was really welcoming to anyone who uses a wheelchair. And so over time it meant we literally cut out half of a pew and we did some polling to find out if you're using a wheelchair and coming to church, would you rather sit in the front or the middle or the back, knowing that we of course cannot accommodate everyone's desires. We're in Connecticut where the back pews are actually the most coveted ones. And so the wheelchair access is um, kind of two thirds of the way back. But all that is to say that asking some basic questions enabled us to make some changes um, that I hope reflect the desire to have our elderly members of our congregation, as well as those who are not as physically mobile as others to feel like they belong. They're not just included, but they belong. Uh, the next slide says, use your heart, reach out for help. We see this in this story of this woman and Jairus, but we also need it so much in our lives. The way we reach out for help is twofold. One is vertical. We reach out to help for help from God. And that is going to come in the form of prayer and it's going to come in the form of reading the Bible and it's going to come in the form of rooting ourselves deeply in the love of God so that it is that love that equips and empowers us to do the long work of healing in our own lives and in our communities. 
But then there's also a horizontal aspect to reaching out for help. And that means building relationships, building relationships with people who are not like us. So again, you can see my own ignorance that I didn't actually stop Edie and say, how would it help? What can we do? What is your experience like? How can you get into church most comfortably? So I didn't use my heart very well in that situation. But over time, as we connect in friendships, in relationships of spiritual care and uh, spiritual receiving from one another, we begin to ask the question, who belongs here and why? What do our programs communicate? What does our leadership communicate? What does our architecture communicate about who belongs here? And what changes can we make to reflect who we want to have belong here. Again, one quick example. Um, when I was uh, about a year into being a mom, so Penny was about a year old, I went on a retreat and I was at a monastery in North Carolina. And there was an elderly brother at this monastery who had some form of intellectual disability who was uh, called upon to read scripture. And he read in what was somewhat a garbled way and he read from Genesis chapter one. And I remembered back to a pastor friend of mine asking if he should allow someone with an intellectual disability to speak from up front because they might be hard to understand. And because it might, he didn't use these words, but it might uh, tarnish the image of the church was really what he was saying. As I was standing there listening to this man read from Genesis 1, I was overwhelmed with the sense that I belonged in that room, that my child belonged, that I had been welcomed, and that anyone was invited to participate in the life of the community of faith, that anyone was invited to share their gifts, to read the scripture, to pray, to be, and to belong together. So asking that question of who belongs here and how do our spaces, our opportunities for leadership, and our opportunities for um, community reflect who belongs here. And then finally, in the next slide, use your hands. After we've done that work of asking the question of uh, what do I want to learn and doing some of that research and learning, asking that question of who belongs here, how, do our, how does our architecture, our leadership, our programs, how do they reflect uh, who belongs here? Then we say, okay, let's use our hands. Let's participate in the healing work that God has equipped us to do. And that might mean changing your physical space. It might mean changing who reads scripture. It might mean, you know what, we're a big enough community and we'd really love to have someone who's able to translate into sign language in our worship services. It might mean we want to ask about having things that are both written in words and also visually cued through our PowerPoint projectors. It might mean we're making programmatic changes in order to welcome a broader array of people. It also might mean we need to do some collaborative work. We need to partner. If we've got no one in our churches who are people or families with kids with disabilities, then that may mean that we need to build up some trust with those communities. It can be easy to get to a point of wanting to change things and thinking all we need to do is invite those people, those people out there who haven't been here before, when really what we need to do is build trust with the people who have not been welcomed into our communities. That involves listening. That involves sometimes lamenting and repenting before it can lead to communities of love and belonging. Collaborative work might take the uh, form of finding another church family or even just other members of a community, people who are living in a group home who have a faith background but who have not been participating in a church and saying, can we pray together? Can we pray together for the healing of our community? It might mean finding other people and saying, can we do a project that would bless our community together and build relationships in that way? I believe that taking action is actually not the challenge that we face. The challenge is our mindset. The challenge is our lack of theological imagination, our lack of understanding of our common humanity and the ways in which all of us 
have needs, and all of us have gifts to offer, if only we have eyes to see them. Our challenge is in our common humanity that allows us to celebrate diversity. The change will not happen no matter how many action steps we take unless we are able to come to a different place in our heads and our hearts and in our relationships. Eric Carter, uh, Bill mentioned earlier on this um, webinar, is a man who has done a lot of research through uh, Vanderbilt University. And I'm gonna, again, send a link with some of his resources. He has some tip sheets for how congregations can enact some of these changes. But he also says frequently, when I've heard him speak, none of this is hard to understand. None of it is hard to execute because it's just basic hospitality 101. What's hard is for us as the church to imagine doing it differently, to imagine what it would be like to be places of belonging and to see the way we do things differently. The end result is to begin to live into the abundance that God offers to us, to begin to live lives of mutual dependence, uh, to begin to be places where we see and taste a glimpse of the kingdom of God. There's a prayer in Ephesians chapter three, and uh, the writer of Ephesians at this point has spent three chapters writing about these social divisions in the church and this uh, kind of problem that he is triumphantly saying Jesus has overcome. He then ends by praying for God's love to be what equips the Ephesians, the church in Ephesus, by the power that is at work among them in God's love that equips them to do a work of reconciliation in their communities. That's certainly my prayer for myself and for you all, is that we would be rooted in God's love, connected to one another in such a way that we are equipped and empowered to bring healing is in our individual lives, but also in our communities so that we can be places of belonging for everyone who might step in the door. Um, I have one more slide here, which is just um, some information uh, for you all if you want to look up some of the books and resources I've talked about. I will again send an email to you with um, the Head, Heart, Hands Action Guide as just a free download. Um, but you also can find other articles as well as um, links to various resources on my website there. And I think now we have about 10 minutes for questions, which um, Molly will moderate and offer to me. Thanks so much for being here. Julia, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, and I apologize for the, um, the shakiness with the slides. It seems like I was trying to monitor the chat box, and every time I moved to look at the chat box, the screen decided to advance itself. It was no. So I gave up looking at the chat box. I'm assuming, Bill, that you have been monitoring the chat box. So if we can start there, if there are any questions that were in the chat box, that we can do that. Um, and I would ask that you type into the chat box if you have other questions as well. I haven't, <clears throat> I haven't seen any questions, but I've got one, um, which is, as I listen to you today and the kind of <clears throat> what I like, and I've, it's not, you know, I, I've read White Picket Fences, heard you last year, um, uh, and the honesty, I think, involved in acknowledging the hurt and the harm and so on. What's been going through my mind is all the news about acknowledging the pain and the fear and the scare uh, that so many African-American people have about mm. police forces and, you know, and acknowledging that, that we've got to be as a people willing to acknowledge uh, uh, that deep history there of mistreatment of people and this, and, and until, and that's what people, you hear people and voices trying to get us to acknowledge. I mean, that I was listening to, um, um, the, uh, what is the in the the public radio s news story this morning? Yeah, and they had 
ask a week ago for people to write the poems about their feelings about Avery, Am Ahmad Avery, mm. and uh, the moderator and the their poet in residence, who's African American, yeah. had pulled a number of them together in kind of a long poem, which they then co-read back and forth to each other. Mm. And it was incredibly powerful. And yeah. so much about it was hear, listen to, you know, listen to this pain. And there, there are real parallels, I think. In, in, yeah, and I, you know, I think I, I've been thinking about this today just because um, I just learned about this um, death out in Minneapolis on Monday of a man yeah. named George Floyd. Um, which is just um, strikingly and horrifyingly similar to so many other deaths of African-American men that we've heard and read about. And what I've been thinking about is the idea of compassion as suffering with, as a able-bodied, white, educated, affluent person, I tend to think that when there are problems, if I'm gonna get involved, that means I'm going to get involved in fixing those problems. I think that has come with my training um, that, yeah, you study a problem and then you come up with a solution. It's kind of the same as like a medical model of disease, right? Like you attempt, you understand the disease and you come up with a cure as opposed to what does it mean to simply enter into the suffering that so many African-Americans have experienced personally. And even when they haven't experienced something as horrific as uh, you know, police brutality or violence, they experience it in terms of the fear, anger, hopelessness that comes up every time one of these stories makes the news. Um, and even when they don't make the news and they just happen in a community and you know about it. And so for me as a person um, of privilege to say, all I can do is acknowledge this. All I can do is sit in it with you, pay attention to what's happening, pray for you, care that it's happening, but I can't fix it. I can't make it better. There's something really humbling and powerless about that, but I also believe that's absolutely what Jesus does with us, um, is he enters in and suffers with us and alongside us, rather than saying, I'm just gonna fix it all. Um, and there's, of course, we're talking about an ultimate hope for redemption um, but there's also a real power in being willing to stand alongside and to suffer with um, and to not walk away from that suffering, but to actually just be present in it. I had an experience just earlier this week with Penny, my daughter, um, and out of protecting her privacy, I can't share the details, but I was sad about something that happened with her and I shared it with a group of friends and what I've so appreciated was that they all said, that sounds hard, I'm in it with you. But none of them said, here's what you should have done differently. Here's the advice that I'll offer. Here's how, you know, here's how to be a better mom or just because Penny has a disability doesn't mean she's any different. You know, it was like, they just entered into it with me and it was incredibly healing actually simply to have their presence in that place. And I think that's true for us. Um, but hard for us to say, I'm just going to sit and listen. I'm going to lament. And that's what it means to bring love into this situation right now. Even though every instinct I have is either to hide from your pain or to try to um, heal it entirely. So we have a couple of questions. Um, so Barbara Newman asks, do you see some benefit in this unusual time that churches are really forced to see and reimagine gathering and belonging? And it's kind of similar to what I've been thinking in terms of what we have learned from our quarantine and our isolation, because people with disabilities are always isolated. I mean, mm. you know, honestly, not, not every person with a disability, but if you live in a group home or in a really segregated setting, you may be far more isolated than not. Um, and as you think about, I, I will tell you that I have um, uh, children and grandchildren who are African American, and I worry terribly about their safety when they go out. Um, and we've had to have the hard conversations about what you do if you're stopped by police. Now we're talking about people who are afraid to go out because they might get sick. So can you carry 
forward some of what you're learning from all of these things, which I think, Barbara, is, is, is some of what you're asking as well. How do we, how do we translate that into some action? I do. So yes, I think it's possible that there's so much blessing that can come um, out of a time like this um, without being like relentlessly positive about the pain and hardship that so many people are experiencing in this time for a variety of reasons. So there's, of course, just the um, the fact that we are stuck with ourselves in a time like this and have to do some of that deep inner work um, because we're forced to confront ourselves and not just be entertained and busy all the time. Um, that is for people like me who are able to be staying at home. But I think there's also a sense of um, what does it mean to be rooted and established in the love of God and perhaps what do Uh, Amy Julia, we've lost your sound. You've She's sort frozen. of frozen. You're frozen. Hmm. Wow. I don't know how to unfreeze you. <laughs> That's not, they did not come in my Zoom lessons. I'm sorry. I don't know how to do that. Uh, <laughs> this she is might. Not, um, I'm thinking it's for internet connection. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, so it's just somebody just gave the answer. She needs to turn our camera off and turn it back on. Ah, can we do that? Let's try that. I think she left and she will rejoin. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, in the interim, we have a couple of other points of discussion. Um, again, around what do we learn and um, what are we learning to be the church outside of the building? Because we can't be in the building. That's um, Evelyn McMullen's question. Um, how do we learn from families with disabilities they know how to live in isolation? Um, <laughs> I, I am a family who, have, who raised a child with a disability. We did learn to live with a lot of isolation. Um, I think what you learn is resilience and you learn how to build a circle of people who can just be there for you uh, by phone or, you know, you, you build a circle that keeps you going. At least that's what I learned. Anybody have any other thoughts on that? I'm more than happy to hear from you. And Molly, I'm back now. Just oh, so thank you. heaven. <laughs> Sorry. Don't know what happened. It was like, where did she go? <laughs> I, beats me. I don't know. So, uh, but I am back and I'm sorry about that. Um, okay. And it, I'm sure you said something brilliant. So <laughs> I'm actually not. The question came up from Emily McMullen. She wanted to know how can we learn from families with disabilities? They know how to live in isolation and it's an opportunity for them to teach us. And what I was saying is, yes, I raised a child with disabilities and yes, we were very isolated because she had a lot of medical issues as well. Um, but I think we learned resilience. We learned kind of how to build um, through our faith and our faith communities and just our community of friends. Um, we learned to, to find places to talk it out and to talk it through with, with folks who could, who could support us. And um, I will say in this time of isolation, because I am now, um, my children and grandchildren have moved away, I'm on my own. Um, so being in social isolation by yourself hasn't been a big problem for me because I do have that. So um, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Well, you know, it's, I agree with that. I also, though, think that um, what I also see is how isolated Penny's life becomes when she's not able to be physically present with people. Um, communication is harder. She doesn't have the same social interactions that my other kids do with friends. And I'm grateful for the people who are reaching out to her, but they are not peers. Um, whereas at school, that happens just much more naturally. Um, I, I do not blame 14 year olds for not reaching out to my daughter, but I do think that uh, anyone who is experiencing the pain of isolation is, so certainly people with disabilities can, uh, teach us about how to endure with grace and love and hope social isolation. 
I also think if you've not experienced this before and it's feeling painful, that can help you have compassion and empathy and understand what it feels like to be someone who has been isolated from the rest of communities because it's just really hard. Um, I mean, that's the other thing I've seen. So I think it goes both ways where it's both a yes, we can learn um, how, you know, how to endure, but we can also learn that this is really hard and human beings were made and meant for each other. And so we want, again, to build churches and build communities where that can happen, especially for the people who are most likely to be isolated. This next question is from Randy Fry. Um, Amy, has your church made changes in the worship liturgy itself to encourage a sense of belonging? And if so, what have they been? The short answer there is no, <laughs> um, just in the sense that we use a pretty, um, our liturgy is fairly diverse to begin with. But I do think there are ways in which the liturgy does communicate a sense of belonging in that we try to have a diverse array of, so we have a pretty set format as far as prayers of the people and prayers of confession. And it's again, a relatively traditional format. Um, and yet we try to call forth prayers that are expressive of a diverse array of people. Um, whether that has to do with race or justice issues or whether it has to do with disability um, and other concerns. Um, the other thing I will say is our pastor, we live in a predominantly white town and our, I mean, exclusive, almost exclusively white suburban, you know, Connecticut town. Um, and our pastor has been really intentional in having other pastors of color and leaders of color come and preach, which I think has been a way of from the front saying um, everyone belongs here. And we've done work in terms of expanding what, not just who is in the pulpit, but also what comes from the pulpit. Um, but there's not been any specific change to the liturgy. It's more been being deliberate about the, um, what is said from up front, including the prayers that we pray. Um, I'm going to keep going through these questions, but I know it's a little bit after three, and I do want to ask each of you, if you look in the chat box, there's a link to a survey. We are a University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. Any of you who work for you said no, we need our data in order to stay funded. So please, please fill out that link. And we also will be sending it along with the resources tomorrow. So please click on the link. It's a really short survey. Um, just click on it, fill it out, and hit submit and we would much appreciate it. Um, that's my only commercial. I'm gonna keep going here. Um, from Tammy Kane, um, there is mistreatment in how some churches view individuals who have a disability. I talked with a father who has told me he would never set foot in a church. He was told to bring, he was told that bringing his teenage son who uses a wheelchair for mobility up the many set of steps to go into the church was causing a distraction. The father was asked not to bring his son to church again. How do we try and help these wounds. Yeah, so there are far too many stories that reflect that question. So not just that particular experience um, and far too many people and families who've had um, children who have been considered disruptive in church uh, because of various disabilities. Um, and that's where, again, the answer has to do with mindset of the church more than it has to do with any the physical spaces we can adjust and the expectations for you know how you comport yourself in worship we can adjust those really easily but it is that work of what does it mean to be the body of christ and who are we who do we want to be who belongs here that's the deeper work um, that is actually is harder uh, to accomplish so it sounds like there are two concerns here one is for the particular concern, it might be, okay, who else in this church body cares about these things and how can we gather and begin to ask questions and pray? And there are all sorts of, you know, whether it's hosting some uh, opportunities to come and talk and listen and um, grow or whether it's uh, going out to people in the community um, and taking a survey and saying, okay, if you are a family that has a child with a disability and you don't come to church, why not? Um, and gathering some of that information. Um, 
I know there have been churches that have been convinced that they're missing out on a whole group of their population. Um, and so as a result, they've wanted to change the way they welcome people with disabilities. But again, a lot of that is heart work, um, which is harder to check the boxes on other than to say that um, gathering, even if it's just two or three who are concerned about the same things and working together towards institutional change. Um, and then, but also being the person who goes to that parent and that child and who says, I'm sorry, that shouldn't have happened to you. And even if I can't say this church welcomes you, I can tell you as a fellow believer that you shouldn't have had to um, go through that and I'm really sorry. And our final question comes from Evelyn Tinsley who says as a member of the black community, I can tell you there's a great deal of doubt, fear and even anger. Is anyone prepared for that? And she clarifies that she's referring to some church members. A great deal of doubt, fear, and anger. Um, and I don't know, Evelyn, whether you're referring to um, collaboration with people in white churches, I mean, or whether you're talking specifically about disability, but it makes sense to me <laughs> that anyone who is in America right now and who is in a black community um, feels doubt, fear, and anger, even as it relates to Christians who are white Christians. And I think that's one of the areas where um, we can know that God's heart is grieved. And our responsibility is simply to continue to walk the path of healing together. I was a part of, um, well, I'll tell one story about uh, that actually comes up in my book, White Picket Fences, towards the end in the town where I grew up, which was a small um, southern town in North Carolina. Um, there was a young African American boy who was shot. And as a result, long story that's actually quite beautiful and worth telling, but I won't tell the whole thing. As a result of that, um, some white Christians and some black Christians in town started praying together. Um, against violence. So they had a purpose that was outside of themselves. They weren't gathering for racial reconciliation. They weren't gathering in order to become a new church. They just cared about their town and they cared about the fact that there were kids who were dying. And so they decided to start praying together. And it has not been this perfect or even um, amazingly transformative work, but it has been a faithful and consistent work that has begun to build relationships of trust and care between sectors of a community that were not connected in those ways before. And that has led to conversation about school reform and what would it mean to welcome people who've been in prison back into our community and look for job opportunities. And so I do think that um, for, historically white and historically black churches, um, there's a lot of history of wrongdoing on the part of the white churches and mistrust for very understandable reasons um, and doubt and fear on the part of the black churches. Um, and the work we need to do is that of collaborating together and listening um, and lamenting and then turning to what it might look like to heal and come together really a great way to close this conversation. Um, Amy Julia Becker, I really want to thank you. It's been a fabulous hour with you. Phil Gaventa, thank you for helping put this together and hosting this and making it all happen. And to everybody who came and participated, thank you for your commitment and your willingness to go to your faith communities and make them welcome and inclusive. So with that, thank you. Be well, and please watch for that email. It will have the link to our satisfaction survey. Please fill that out for us and give us that data. And um, I know Amy Julia is also sending you a lot of resources as well. So take care, everyone, and thank you. All right, thank you.